You're having too much fun. Get on tags. <laughs> we in here trying to build this multi-billion dollar empire and you want to turn it into a damn Snoop Dogg party. You tripping. Don't you see we got serious business in here with us today? This lady got 80 kids she got to look after. She don't want to hit no damn Snoop Dogg dog. <laughs> You remember the house part? You don't, you don't want to get on them public animal. <laughs> you don't play some baby shark? Give me some. Nah, before we even do this, give me some daycare music. Let me see what you got over there for the kids. Racing corner. Yeah, because you, you might get, that might be your next gig. You might be booked at the daycare. <laughs> Show me you got range. Show me something you can play for the kids. And it better not be sexy red. <laughs> I saw that video of all them kids at the school singing sexy red. That's what you would play for the kids. You think so? <laughs> I see where you're going with this. You can put a nice little message in this. I can see it. Like on some Sesame Street vibes, like... Don't... Get in the car with strangers. <laughs> that could lead to some danger. Okay. If you're in trouble, say, I don't know this motherfucker on the double. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like that one. It's giving me more bedtime music. Yeah. Jumping in the bed, it's fun and you laugh until your mom comes home and kicks you ass. All right, stop. <laughs> no, don't, not for the kids. That's, get back to the series. All right, man, the black market is over. The black market is open right now, today. You might be walking through the black market and, and them kids just get to run around. Mm -hmm. My back is this. Mm-mm. We, are, we got that covered, too. I went and had to call a specialist <laughs> who runs a daycare, but it don't just stop at the daytime. It's a daycare, but since daylight savings then kicked in, it's a little night care for about an hour because it get dark early. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's, what, that's what I'm on. Hold up, hold up. Wait a minute. We can't start yet. We can't start. I need my side notes. They what? <laughs> <laughs> Who threw my shit on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> now I got all these notes about. I know everything. I'll make sure you don't leave nothing out. This is not for me. This is to make sure you say everything. Because when I ask for the information, people be like, mm, they already know. I'm like, tell them anyway. They don't know, they don't know who be watching us at the black market. We got people from South Africa, Australia, a few little Chinese. I'm not sure if it's Chinese, but it looked like Chinese in the comments. Okay. You know how like they got the little Chinese. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if it's Chinese or, or, Japanese. or Japanese or Mandarin or whatever it is, they over there and they watching. So pick you a camera, whichever. You know how people are like, this is my good side. I, I do this side. Pick you a camera and let them know exactly who you are and what you got going on today on the black market. Hey, I am Katrina Melton, the proud owner of Gentle Gems Developmental Learning Center, where I serve six weeks through 12 years of age. As well, I'm a new children's author of The Mighty Meltons versus A Sickly Sticky Situation. Now, how do you know the baby be six weeks? Um, the birth certificate. Oh, you had to have the birth certificate? Mm -hmm. I thought you could just eyeball the baby, like, two more <laughs> weeks. <laughs> have people tried to bring uh, babies that weren't six weeks to you, though? They tried, like, around three weeks. I could accept them at three weeks. I just feel like they very fragile, and they just need to just Require stay at home. Require more care, yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
How did you get into this industry and start with the kids? Um, since I was a little girl, I always wanted to be somebody's boss. Just, you That's know, a teacher. That's the most honest <laughs> answer I have ever heard. <laughs> um, I have an older brother and a younger brother, so I typically told them what to do. They was my students while I kind of ran what I ran. Sir, um, how do you deal with this? She still tells me what to do, and I'm older than she is. <laughs> really? Really. Who you bring with you today? My husband. He's the back person to, to all of this. Like, he does everything under the scenes. Like, he don't like to be in front. He does everything you tell him to do. Pretty nah. much. <laughs> <laughs> he does a good job at it, though. No, nah, that's dope, man. How, how you deal with having a bossy lady? <sighs> I feel like it's a lot of dudes that would love to hear that part. Nah, she, uh, it's teamwork. You know, she's the, the vision that I make manifest, if that makes sense. That's good. Yeah. See, that's the best part about having a team, is playing your part, and, and you get you said shit, that's your role you wanted, I do the other shit. Yeah, you're a smart yeah. man. I just picked up some game from there, right there. <laughs> 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 so yeah, six weeks to five years old? 12. 12? Mm -hmm. Oh, you see, that's the market right there. They usually make you go to school at five, but it's after school, so we have an after school program as well as a summer camp program. See how I parlayed that in there? Mm -hmm. So tell me about the book. Um, so The Mighty Melt is versus a stickly situation. It's about pretty much a superhero family um, that fights this virus that corrupts their city. Um, the book came about, I actually went on vacation with my dad for the very first time. So I moved from Chicago to North Carolina because we had it rough. We was pretty much living in an abandoned building. Damn. Um, yeah. So we ended up moving to Greensboro for a better life. My dad, of course, wasn't around, um, as he should have been. Um, but during this time, we he decided to come down and actually visit us. And we took him to the beach. And the Lord just pretty much brought upon me, like, you work with children, you know, make a book that talks about COVID to teach the children, you know, why they're not in school and, you know, what is happening, you know, right now. So I was like, okay, I hear you, Lord. He was like, use your family um, inside the book as superheroes because our black children is not able to see a family that is married, number one. Um, and I worked for the school system for seven years and they look upon custodians and I just want to bring a different feel to the book. You know, dad, they don't see dad in the house cooking. So I want the show because he's the cook um, inside the house. So I just want to bring a lot of that into the book. Um, I end up getting kind of discouraged when it came to the book. So I was like, I don't want to make it seem like I'm kind of like just making COVID kind of, because people was dying during this time. Yeah. So I'm just like how COVID <laughs> got, you know, bought with them saying that the bat kind of, it was a bat type thing. So I was like, should I put a bat in the book? It was just a lot of things I was just kind of dealing with, you know, in my mind. So I actually put down a book. Yeah, um, trying to make light of a serious right, situation. Exactly. So I was just like, you know, maybe I just put it down and I just kind of left it alone for a while. Um, then I actually went to one of your shows, the 85 South Tour. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so. Inspiring greatness. Yes. So we do. The greats watch us. So this time we with that we actually had VIP tickets. Um, and you was actually talking about your DJ, DJ Rich, um, and how he's a digital creator and how he, you know, got the Roach Motel. Right. So I was like, oh, okay, digital creator. So you gave all his information, his Instagram and things of that nature. So I reached out to him and was like, I got this children's book and I would love for you to illustrate it. And he was like, immediate yes. And I said, hey, this got to be a scam. This cannot be him. So I asked him to FaceTime me, and we started collabing. Um, and Tell me, Rich, pop in right quick, man. I just want the people to see you right quick, just so they'll know. <laughs> yes. This is our official tour, DJ. <laughs> DJ Filthy Rich. How you doing, man? He ain't even mic'd up. Nah, I ain't mic'd up. Sorry. My voice is carry. Exactly, man. What did you think when she hit you and, and, and laid the idea out? I thought it was cool because, you know, COVID was crazy. This was still around the time where it was still hitting everybody. You right. Know what I mean, so, plus I just like to work, bro. I like to create. So she was like, I want to create this. I'm like, all right, cool. So she was nervous. She was nervous. She, she was like, I don't know. And then we started going back and forth. And then when I, I really just like the concept, bro. You know, we got kids. Yeah. I'm like, my kids really only know COVID from getting it. <laughs> and then what we see on the news. And right. I just like her take on it. 
It's a black family, superheroes. So we actually brought Jeff in too. Shout out to Jeff, the art director. Yeah. You know what I mean? We kept in the family because it was just a lot of work, and I'm like, man, I need Jeff to come on in, and we made it happen, man. I'm proud of you for. Well, see, I'm glad you. that you came on and you told that story because when people come up, he'll tell you like they'll be like, hey man, I'm thinking of, and I give them the the resources or the contact to the right. person. You know, who I know would be able to better facilitate that, you know what I mean? And then they don't follow up. I'm like, well, don't waste people's time. If you, why you want me to do all the work? Like, yes. the follow up, that's really important in business, man, especially when you reach out like that. And then, like you said, they reach out, you're not expecting it. They're like, oh, it's got to be fake. They reach back out. Like, mm -hmm. shit, take advantage of it. And I'm glad that you did. Yes. And, and now you get to see the final product. Yes. Yeah, that's dope. So, um, when I actually picked back up the book, um, I ended up with COVID. Um, I had COVID pneumonia, um, double pneumonia in my lungs. And I already have an uh, autoimmune disease, which is lupus, and stage three kidney disease. Um, and I was pregnant with my son. Damn. So when I caught it, they immediately rushed me. I actually stopped breathing in my sleep, and he woke me up. Because I went to the doctor, but they sent me home just like a regular person and was like, you just got to go home and rest. You got to go home and heal. So I'm just like, OK, that night, I stopped breathing. Um, so when they took me to the hospital, I went into ICU. Um, I was one machine away from the ventilator. Um, and I'm just like, Lord, like, I do not want to go on a ventilator. Like, I'm pregnant. And I literally felt death coming upon me. Um, so he pretty much healed me from that. And during recovery, I actually finished the book. I was in recovery for 15 days, and the Lord just was giving me everything that I needed to finish the book with. Let me ask you this, like, you are you pregnant, COVID, double pneumonia. It's like they already they're like not really giving you they a did. treatment. They for thought it. I was going to die. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because like you're pregnant, and then that limits what they can do mm -hmm. in a whole another way. So like, what was your journey like? Just mentally fighting back and not giving up, and like you're saying, just drawing strength from inside yourself that you didn't even know you had. It was God. Um... Because it, that wasn't my first time I was on my deathbed. When I got diagnosed with lupus, I was going through it. I was pretty much losing my breath. I didn't have breath. Um, so mentally, I've been through so much health-wise, and I know God brought me through. It just was kind of one of those things is, if I die, I just die. But at the same time, I know he got great out here for me. And I serve too many kids and too many families that are low income to where it's not my time yet. Um, so I just continue to pray to him and just say, look, you know what you want me to do? Um, you're going to get me through it. And if I have to be your testimony through this, because I know it's not for me, it's for the people that I serve. Um, and that's the mentality that I had. But during this time, I actually was looking at the daycare building that I wanted. We was looking at this building for four years. The lady ended up giving me the opportunity, but she took the opportunity back. Um, so I bought all this daycare stuff to have to put in storage. Um, but before I end up getting sick, I end up praying on that building. I was like, Lord, if this is for me, let it be for me. Don't let no man stop it. That's when I ended up with COVID and all that stuff happened. She called me when I was in recovery and was like, hey, you could go ahead and rent the building from me. I was in a wheelchair when I left out the hospital on about 60 to 70% of oxygen, rolling the inside of papers to be the proud owner of the business that's inside of that building. So. It's a powerful testimony. Mm -hmm. Somebody's watching this right now that's, that's battling health, needing to hear something, needing to hear some encouraging words. What would you say to them? Just keep fighting. You know, whatever you're going through doesn't have you. You're just battling it. So you don't have lupus or you don't have heart disease or anything like that. You're just battling it. And it's one, you know... I always told God to heal me from my health issues. But after COVID, I ended up with heart disease. Um, and I'm just like, Lord, like, one thing I want to ask him is, you know, how much more can I take? Because he showed you yeah. how much more you could take. He won't give you more than you can handle. Exactly. So I'm just like, you know, I always pray for a heal. I'm just like, Lord, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Um, and my, my prayer for healing kind of turned into... Lord, even though I'm dealing with this, don't let it look like that I'm dealing with, with this. It just let me be able to live a healthy life going through the sicknesses right. that I'm currently still dealing with. And having a good husband by my side really just intensified the fight that I have. Well, let me, I was so. going to ask you this. Like, 
as a man, you know, we don't deal with that outward emotion shit too much. And then to see the woman you love battling and you just having to watch and feeling helpless and, you know, praying and all that, but like, how, what did you draw your strength from? What kept you from, from likewise, just lashing out? Likewise, God. Um, you know, we have four children. And I was tasked with the responsibility while she was sick. Like, right. you know, everything was on me, you know. And um, God just, he, his strength was perfect in my time of weakness. Right. So, you know. What did it show you about the man you are, head of household, head of the family? As, like, as a did man. Did you realize how much shit that still needed to be done, even though, you, you know what I mean? I'm going to be real. As a man, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a figure, uh, per se. So, you know, I knew what I experienced. I didn't want my children to experience. So I was like, you know what? You know, I'm muscle up, do what I got to do. You know, um, it created a strong bond between me and my children also having to go through that. Right. So, you know, as a man, you got to do what you got to do, you know. <clears throat> Hell yeah. What's it been like on the recovery, like you said, getting back to, to the normalcy, getting back to the family and, and seeing it? I know you was proud to see that he held it down while you was going right. through that. Like, what was that experience like for you? Because it's, like you said, you coming back from ICU, so all of, it's your world, but everything's changed now. What was it like for you? Um, it was hard because, like I said, I mean, at this point, I still couldn't breathe. Right. So even though I wanted to do, I couldn't do. So when he left the household, my oldest daughter was there to kind of say, Mom, you know, I got it, I got it. But she was always there, even when she was younger, you know, when I was battling lupus, you know, even like when, cause he ended up having a truck drive, like he did truck driving at night or he did something at night when he was gone from the house, you know, to make additional money. And my daughter had to pick up my son, cause I had another son during that time. Um, she like, she had to pick him up and try to help change him because I was so weak and I couldn't do it. So during that time to where I was recovering, it was more so I kept trying to, because I'm, I'm, I'm on the go all the time. Right. I don't got time to think because I'm literally on the go all the time. So just having that time to really sit down and think it was hard because so many things was coming through my head and so much. Um, so it was really me just being able to just sit there and be taken care of. That's what was going to be my next question. Like, black women pride themselves on being able to deal with so much and be so strong, like they pride of, of the strength that they had. Was it hard for you to ask for help or let people help you? It, yeah, definitely. You know, even with him being my husband, like he said, you know, I'm just kind of... You the most. You got to <laughs> tell me to pipe down. Right. Down. Um, because, I mean, that's just how I grew up. You know, growing up homeless, growing up in poverty, you don't have a choice but to be strong. And nobody can see your weakness, because you would never know what I'm going through. Even if I have a dollar in my pocket, you wouldn't know, because I'm going to walk around with a smile and just nod my head type thing. Um, but now I got to the place to where I have to learn to just let people do it. Like, right now, I had anxiety coming down here, because I'm leaving 80 kids right. in the hands <laughs> of daycare workers, <laughs> transporting, dealing with families. But I knew they could do it. It's just me not being there to see it, and continue to micromanage. Yeah. It was hard. But they've been calling me and saying, we got it. The building not on fire. You good. Just have a good time. So I'm just like, okay. So I learned how to kind of, during that time, that it taught me to just let people take care of you. Yeah. You got it. You know, type that they got it. When well, you say you got four kids, when you so proud? Five. five. I, I don't know what he missed the other well, one. Damn, you, <laughs> you lose count after three. You don't work that man so hard, he forgot to go down. But I'm saying, were you, were you um, surprised to see the new roles that the kids stepped up and, and did their responsibilities? and getting oh, their, definitely. You know what I mean? Like going to bed and getting that, you know what I mean? Getting into that routine with... But you know, they, that place that you just used to being in and seeing that since you weren't there, it, they stepped up and did that thing. Yeah, my kids was is kind of always like that. I mean, they they do what they want to do anyway sometimes, but they very helpful um, because, like I said, I've been dealing with my health for a while now. So, like my son, he just like, mom, you need some drink. You know, you want me to um, give you know my brother a bath, and I'm just like, it's okay, you know, kind of I got this type thing. So my kids, they are aware of what I go through and what I deal with. So they are prone to just want to help, and they know when I'm down, because my son come to me, he's my little preacher. <laughs> he's like, Mama, 
want to take off your socks? I'm just like, boy, <laughs> I'm good, <laughs> type thing. So I kind of knew he was going to hold it down and be able to manage the family without me because we do it together. What I like he has and what he like I have. And he just took on everything that I had and just made sure that he held it down while I was recovering. Somebody watching this right now saying, man, I love her story. I love that lady's spirit. She's so tough. She's so resilient. I would love to have a conversation with her or, or bring my kids to a daycare. Or How can they get in touch with you? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Trina Bean as well as Gmail at Inner Voice Publishing 23. What would you say to the women, to the audience, who, who may have an idea just like you, want to pull their book off? What would you say to them? Um, I kind of use that quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, you know, you see a staircase, but you got to take that first step. You got to have faith. You know, if you just had that vision in your head, even if you just, if you put it on paper, if you don't take the step, you just never know where it will get you. So just take the step. It, it pretty much push you back when you don't. You know, so if you take a, the step and continue to try and do whatever you got to do, then you see the outcome. Now you see why I couldn't tell her no? Exactly. <laughs> she called me and telling me this whole story. I'm supposed to say no. You can't. Right. It had to happen. Yeah. I'm looking forward to more books out of the collection. I hope you keep it going. I hope we, this, this is number one? Yes, yeah, number one. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> the now. The first book. So yeah, let's keep it going. Let's get to 100. Work the shit out of them. I will call do it. Yeah, yeah, call it. Yeah, 100 percent independent. Good. Came up with the publisher name. I'm, and... yes. I'm supporting that 1,000 percent. Yes. Well, don't don't stop. Keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you hit the social media, the website, support this lady, get her book. She take care of 80 babies out here. That's the future. That's, that could be 80 presidents that you True. got in there. Yeah. Or uh, 80 secretaries of state, or 80 doctors. We don't know. Whatever resources that we can provide for you and get you access to through our networks, please let us know, because the children are the future. They're going to take care of us when we are old and decrepit. So I love your story. I appreciate y'all stopping through here. Please don't let this be the last time that we see y'all over here on the black market. Definitely, thank All you. All right, well look here, let me let them know. The black market wide open right now. Right now. And that's how we living.